Hello and welcome back to Sociology 101. We have with us a guest that you may recognize if you've been a part of Sociology 1 for, what, seven years? Dr. Kurt Jaros is back with us. Welcome, Kurt. It's good to have you, brother. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I had to check when the last time I was that I was on the program, and it's it's been quite a while. But of course, you and I stay in touch uh, for a number of ministry purposes, and of course, we're in similar circles, similar conversations. Uh, so yeah, great to be with you today, Leighton. Yeah, I've said in some of your uh, sessions at ETS and other places, you're always presenting somewhere two or three times. I mean, they they, <laughs> they turn me down whenever I submit papers, but no, they'll give Kurt like four or five. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't I don't know. He's he's a one of they call real scholars, you know, with a PhD or whatever. It is, you know, <laughs> like, whatever. I'm well, not bitter. My, my uh, EPS, <laughs> uh, my philosophy paper that I submitted this year was turned down, uh, but my ETS one was accepted. Oh, that makes me so. feel better. Okay, I, I'm, I feel better about that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I'm but joking. The, the one I did on e EPS a couple years ago that was a real interesting one on Gregory of Nyssa and uh, basically proto Molinism. It was fascinating stuff I uncovered. Well, Kurt, I appreciate your work and and your the manner in which you present it. I, I know you have friends on all sides of this discussion, always getting together and um, j you know jabbing at each other and, and making jokes in the hallways at the EPS meetings and those kinds of places. And uh, and I appreciate your spirit in which you handle the disagreements, um, which which is the mark of an educated mind, as I think the old saying goes. The mark of an educated mind is is one who is able to entertain a thought without necessarily accepting it. And you're able to entertain other people's views, um, you know, get some back and forth with them, engage with these discussions without becoming overly contentious over it, but yet still firmly holding your position. Um, I, I'm drawn to scholars like that. And so that's one of the reasons I think you and I have gotten along so well over the years. Um, and you and I very likely don't agree with every every with each other on every point either. I, I know that uh, just like with Idol Killer over here and and uh, and others that I've had on the program, Calvinists included, who are you know basically theistic determinists to the to the, to to, to uh, a large degree. Yeah. I obviously disagree with them, but I still love and have friends that are on that side of the aisle, and I know you do as well. So I I, I appreciate that. Um, speaking of which, um, we've had some what. what what initiated this conversation uh, were some Twitter wars kind of going on. And Twitter wars can be fun, but they also can be a little bit... I, this is one of the reasons I, I don't like social media so much um, because the nuance of the the winsomeness of a comment or a jab can come across as a lot more harsh than it's intended or you can't see the smile or the wink or the, you know what I'm saying? You can do the little emojis and things like that sometimes, but it top, it oftentimes just falls right into the mud and becomes yep. just contentious and not real fun. Well, and yeah, I, and I, yeah. I don't prefer the, the social media wars, as you say, even though I tap in from time to time, but I prefer more constructive formats like uh, recorded dialogues, discussions, even formal debates uh, I'm, I'm willing to have with people. A formal debate with a live audience even a formal written debate where we're given, you know, X amount of words for our opening statement, X amount of words for our responses, that sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, I've, I've encountered this fellow that I haven't known, but you've, you've known about. His name's Ron. And, uh, you know, he's clearly done his homework. He's providing scholarly sources, et cetera. Um, but, you know, it's, it's in the context of Twitter, and he only wants to stay in Twitter, which is really weird to me um, because... He says he doesn't have time, but he clearly has time to be tweeting these lengthy yeah, tweets. Yeah, well, and plus, it, yeah. it, it seems weird about that is that on a written and a written discourse, you can take as much time as you want. You can say, well, I'll get back to you in three months. You know, let me, yeah. on my leisure, I'll, you know, put this together and get back to you. So saying you don't have the time for something really means I don't want to invest the time yeah. in dealing with your arguments is what he what he really means by that. And and that's fine. I, I You know, the, the, what what... The, the reason I was having an issue with Ron is because he was chiding me for not wanting to get into the weeds of the Pelagian debate between Bonner's work and the other scholars on who Twitter. disagree with her on Twitter. I, I just didn't want to get into that. Plus, <laughs> I didn't think it had to do with the major point of contention that I was raising in that first uh, original tweet about MacArthur. And so I saw it as a red herring. And so when you chimed in, I just said, hey, there you go. There's your Huckleberry if you want. Go talk to an actual uh, scholar, a PhD, who's actually published on this controversy and have your discussion with him if you want to, Ron. But it has nothing to do, it has, uh, I should say, it has little to do with my post on Twitter 
calling Calvinist out. And I'll give you some history of this for for those that like these kinds of you know theology geeks as we are. If you're tuning into something like this titled "Searching for Semi Pelagians" with Dr. Kurt Juros, then you probably are a theology geek, whether you like to admit that or not. And, and, and we're going to see if we're going to find any semi Pelagians today. <laughs> yeah, we're going to we're going to look for that, and we will get to the scholarly portion of that towards the latter part of this discussion. So for those that just tuned in to, as to to get the the work that Dr. Jaros has done on semi-Pelagianism and the development of that. Fast forward through this, you know, the, this fun part of it, if you, if you would like to. But for those of us who are theology geeks that like to kind of deal with these things, I, I want to give you some back backdrop to this. Um, here's how it all started. Here's 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 kind of the backdrop for this. Okay, um, I I made this tweet, which later, by the way, even Phil Johnson with Grace to You Ministries, he's the ghost writer for John MacArthur. Um, uh, he's retweeted some of the responses that Ron made and things like that. And so it's just become this kind of this uh, big fight on bitter, big Twitter war, I guess you could call it. And so um, what what the point I make is, and, and by the way, Kurt, you haven't seen this clip. Or yeah, yeah. You don't even, not this is the, new to you. Yeah, not, not only the clip, but I'll be honest, I haven't even seen your tweet. Like somehow, I don't know if I was tagged or if it just popped up. I saw some tweet well after this conversation got started. So for me, I'm actually viewing this for the first time. So I've got to pay attention here. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, well, we'll get your feedback. Before we get into your, your actual scholarship and your work here, we'll have fun with the Twitter word and see kind of how, how that pans itself out. And, and it does it does relate. Uh, in fact, you'll hear, um, you'll hear why it relates because the whole development, the history development of Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism stems from this, this thing that you're going to see MacArthur do today. In other words, what MacArthur's doing today is seen repeated throughout history, and that's my charge. Um, and and Dr. Jaros here, Kurt, I, I, I'll stop referring to you as Dr. Jaros. You're, you're a friend. You call me late, and I'll call you Kurt. Um, I, I want you to see how this development occurs, and it, it occurs through the boogeyman tactics that you're about to see. Uh, and so that, that's why I think this is relevant to our discussion and why, why it pertains to us today, because history repeats itself, especially if you don't know the mistakes of our past, you tend to repeat the, the mistakes of history. And what Kurt has uncovered or what Kurt has really highlighted in his own studies, I think is exemplifies this same error that you see from John MacArthur. So it does tie in. There, there is some great relationship to that. So I, I write, this is how Calvinism has been popularized for generations. The popularizers use fallacious dichotomies to make it seem as if Calvinism is the only group willing to say we need the aid of God for salvation. I don't know a single Arminian, provisionist, or non-Calvinist of any stripe that would deny the need of God's aid. Granted, there may be uneducated masses who would answer survey questions wrongly, but that doesn't represent what non-Calvinistic pastors and scholars believe and teach. Side note. By the way, this is a side note that uh, Ron makes the red herring of this entire discussion and begins to nitpick uh, Ali Bonner and the scholars from our perspective about what they believe with regard to the whole Pelagian controversy. And so this is this, where the side note came from. Okay, We know that even Pelagius himself taught we need divine aid and that Augustine, like many Calvinists today, confessed to misrepresenting his teaching in order to have him anathematized. This false representation has been going on from the beginning of this debate by those who hold to the belief of an effectual particular aid for the unconditionally elected against those who hold to the belief of a general universal aid for all, making it sound like we don't believe any divine aid is needed to be saved. It's absurd and shameful. Now, you may be thinking, surely that's not what John MacArthur says. Surely that's not the representation there. Uh, maybe you're overstating your case. Well, let's uh, take the time to listen to MacArthur uh, for ourselves. Let's listen. 64% of Americans agree that a person obtains peace with God by first taking the initiative to seek God, and then God responds with grace. So summing it up, the majority said, we sin a little, but by nature we're good. We do good, and God rewards our good deeds by loving us. We have the ability to turn to God on our own initiative, and salvation involves us taking the initiative, and then God responds to us. That is a massive lie believed by most people. Sometimes somebody will say to me, why are you a Calvinist? Or why do you believe in the doctrines of grace or sovereignty of God? It's pretty simple. 
Okay, so stop right there for just a second before we go on, because I really want to make this point. Because what Ron does is he responds and says, oh, look, no, MacArthur is comparing Calvinism, Christianity, with the mass of people out there, the majority of people. He's not comparing and contrasting with Arminian theology or with the scholars from Arminianism. And so that's the way he defends MacArthur, which is demonstrably false. One, why wouldn't he just say, why, why do you call a Christian? If he's not talking about a specific form of Christianity, i.e. Calvinistic Christianity, then why would he say Calvinist here? Secondly, I've got another clip that I linked to right below this one where he confronts Arminianism in specific, saying the exact same thing about Arminians as he just now said about the mass of popular opinion. And so for Ron to dismiss me as misrepresenting MacArthur here because he says MacArthur is just contrasting uh, the majority position with Christianity um, it is obviously false because I provide extra uh, material there. And so, um, Ron, sorry, uh, I, I, I proved you wrong already as far as you thinking I misrepresented MacArthur. And so he drops the whole MacArthur thing because I think he probably watched the link that I provided and heard MacArthur actually refer to Arminians using the same kind of vocabulary um, and, uh, and refers to them as full-on Pelagian even calls Charles Finney an Arminian and says, which is full on Pelagianism. And then he goes on to describe what that is. I mean, in the other clip, that's not this clip, but we won't get into that just because we're getting even further. And I want to leave more time for your, your, your stuff. But here's what he goes on to say. This is why he's a Calvinist. Okay. It's, it's really simple. It comes down to this. You ready for this? Can a person unaided by God, a person, a sinful person born into this world, any person, can a sinner unaided by God, left on his own, choose Christ, turn from sin, embrace the truth, receive the gospel, believe and be saved? Can they, Kurt? Can, and, and, and when you ask that, when I ask that question, can they, not only what you personally believe, but what do the historically the people who have been on the quote unquote semi Pelagian side of this debate. What what would they say to that? I'm I'm just curious before we move on. Yeah, I was gonna say, let me know when I can hop in here. <laughs> please please do. This is a good this is a good spot right here. Yeah, uh so let me just say a few preliminary things first here. Uh he you know he provides this stat stat sixty four percent, you know, think that humans can uh you know play some role. I mean even Jesus in Matthew seven says, uh seek and you shall find ask and it'll be given to you. Uh, I mean, so there's clearly some responsive aspect in, within Jesus's own teaching. He's giving an instruction for humans to uh, to have a synergistic role. Uh, all right, so, but this question, this unaided, this concept of unaidedness, this drives me bonkers um, because there is no such thing as an unaided human being. The human being can't even exist without the grace of God. We can't even exist without general providence, okay? There is no such thing. We are talking, in, like, in philosophy terms. This is what's called impossible worlds. Like, maybe you're familiar with, like, a possible world in which so-and-so does something. We're talking about worlds which can't exist. So this is, to me, like a silly theology game. And I think that they're trying to wave their magic hands and pretend like, we can play this game and that this describes what the Bible's describing. Uh, but I just, I just call their bluff. I say, well, wait a second. What do you even mean unaided human? There is no such thing as an unaided human. We all have the grace of God, Christian and non-Christian. Jesus is teaching is explicit on this, that God provides for the righteous and the unrighteous. And uh, so that, that just, like I said, that sort of drives me bonkers because they try to set the terms. They try to frame the debate. And uh, I highly encourage people, people who have seen a number of the interviews I've done like this and read my work, I basically pull the rug out from the game. I say, hey, I, we don't need to play that game. And that's where the that's where people go mistaken. So, you know, I don't, I don't consider myself a, a Calvinist, obviously, but I also don't consider myself an Arminian because I think they're playing the wrong type of ball game. They're, they're trying to solve uh, the relationship between the chronological aspect of grace and free will 
And I view, uh, I hold to what's called the doctrine of concurrence. So it's both the grace of God and the free will of man. It's not an either right. or. Whereas the Calvinist Ar and Arminian are trying to play the either or game and trying to get them to arrange in a certain way. So when you read right. that, and, 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 and it really comes down to how you define what grace is. What are we talking about when we talk about grace? Yeah. And and even Calvinists have terminology for common grace. Uh, in order to allow for this, but it, it, there's the, the fact that they still call it a grace proves our point because when you're not specific and you say they don't need any grace, they don't need any divine aid, and you don't define what you mean by that, then it gives the impression that Arminius and or Arminians or uh, provisionists or any of the things in between of all the different groups that came out of this, I, I cannot, I've never found one of them who comes out and says, that kind of uses that kind of vernacular that a person all on their own, uh, left to themselves without yep. any divine aid whatsoever. This, these kinds of things, nobody says that. And and the fact that they're be, we're being painted as believing that, just like Augustine painted Pelagius as believing that. And and again, um, we've shown where he's done that, documented where he's done that on other broadcasts, which I'll point you to, but. That that's why I pointed this out. This has been going on for generation upon generation upon generation, where the Calvinist types, the determinist types, pretty much say if you don't believe in determinism, then you must be the dichotomy is it's either determinism, God determines what you will choose to do, or God has left you on a spiritual island all by yourself, and you are completely alone, and you by your own power and might that you just conjured up at your own tool shed. You went outside and built yourself a tool shed, uh, this free will in a tool shed because you're doing everything on your own, by, by, apparently. And you and you conjured up uh, from the cauldron of your own righteousness, I've heard it said. And you, you all by yourself, without any aid from God or his grace or anything from God whatsoever, you came to him and you sought after him. You took the first step towards him. All of this kind of vernacular and I'm going, and you just kind of, you, you get to the point where you have to kind of almost roll your eyes at the accusation and say, okay, if you're not willing to hear me out or, and actually represent my perspective with any kind of uh, accuracy or decency, um, then can we really continue to even have this discussion? Um, and and that's, that's what we're asking for. We're, we're asking for you to de at, least, at least do as much as we've attempted to do here on this program what you you do in your work, where you actually cite from the sources from those who disagree with you, and actually put them there side by your side by side, and say, "Here's here's what the scholar on this side is saying. Here's why we disagree with it. Here's where they're playing on the different ball field, so to speak, because they're talking in these terms and these categories, and we don't believe those categories are the biblical categories. And here's why that that's what true scholars do. And so, um, so just to finish out this, I, I want to be fair to MacArthur, just finish out the clip at least, uh, back, back up a little bit and then hear it again. Face the truth, receive the gospel, believe and be saved. If you say yes, which nobody would, then you don't understand man's sinful nature. Okay, okay. so um, that's kind of what we said there. And then that's what I, I was saying is, um, you know, Ron... Um, Ron's response to that, like I said, it's a big, long response here. Right at the beginning of this clip, we hear MacArthur is contrasting his view to what 64% of Americans believe, not what Arminians, Provisionists, or Calvinists believe. And so that's how he defends MacArthur here. That, but it's not like explicit I, from MacArthur. Right. Yeah, it's not explicitly saying this, you know, this is contrast of what Arminians and Provisionists believe. But he ignores the fact that I included a link where he specifically references uh, Arminius, Arminians, and Charles Finney as an Arminian and and actually makes the exact same accusation, actually probably a little harsher accusation in that clip. And Ron just ignores that, of course. And so, in fact, what's interesting about that, and I, I, I'm, I'm not reading into this, but the original video that I critique from uh, MacArthur where he said that has been deleted off of YouTube. And so it's been removed now. Now I still have my record of it because I, you know, had copied his stuff or played his his video. But that video that he originally critiques Arminius and Finney has been taken off of the internet. Now, without any explanation, I don't know. You know, maybe it's just it's old and it's rotated. But he's got all these other videos that are on there and never been taken down. So it just makes me wonder. Maybe 
you rec- maybe you know the powers that be recognized. Yeah, maybe MacArthur didn't do such a good job with this uh, particular clip. Maybe we should take it down. I don't know. I, I can't. I can't speak for that. But um, anyway, um, so that that goes back and forth. And so we're we're kind of so Ron. What the, the history of this is? Ron starts really focusing on the Pelagian controversy, and he starts throwing out all these quotes against what Bonner claims with regard to. Uh, the myth of Pelagianism, and that, MacArthur, or that, that, that Augustine confesses at least three different occasions to, 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 in a sense, admitting that what he's saying may or may not be affirmed by Pelagius, but nevertheless, it needs to be condemned as heresy. And so he, he in a sense, concedes the fact that Pelagius, in absentia, by the way, he wasn't there to defend himself, um, that we need to go ahead and condemn these things that he's being accused of believing, even if he doesn't believe them, because they're so heretical and they're so bad, th- these kinds of things. Um, so he starts really focusing on that. And he quotes from some scholars who take Bonner to task on some of her points and those kinds of things. And then he, and then when I don't respond to those things, but point back to what MacArthur said and why MacArthur said it, and the fact that even scholars above and beyond Bonner uh, concede that yes, maybe maybe Pelagius was misaligned somewhat um, to be anathematized. Yes, he was absent. He wasn't there. Even those that admit that much um, is completely ignored by Ron. Um, and I, I don't want to get into all the weeds of that. Don't desire to get that on Twitter. I was trying to highlight a point that MacArthur was doing the same thing that we've seen throughout history, and I wanted to focus on that. And he wants to go to the Pelagian controversy and then Kurt steps in and goes, I'm your Huckleberry. You know, <laughs> you did not say that. I said that about you. I'm your Huckleberry. Um, I'll I'll have this discussion with you, Ron. Uh, Leighton doesn't want to get into it because it's not the point of contention he was, but I, I'll talk to you about it. Yeah, uh, it's well, my domain. Yeah. Right. I don't have, and then he's he's all, well, I don't want to, I don't have time to do a public d- d- discussion. And then, oh, 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 you'd rather do a written one. Okay, well, how about a written debate? Well, I, I don't have time to do that either. You know, my, I've got a new job and this, this, and this, and I don't want to do that either. Fine. That, that's fine, Ron, if you don't have time to do all those things. But don't chide me for not wanting to follow you down that red herring path if you're not willing to engage with a an actual scholar on the topic uh, who's willing to take the time to, to uh, answer your arguments and to go back and forth with you. So now... That's why Kurt's here. So everybody's all caught up. All right. Did <laughs> yeah, I miss anything there, Kurt? Uh, no, I, I think that was a good a good summary. Um, and uh, I'm already seeing some good comments from folks. Um, a Matthew uh, fellow, uh, Matthew W. I don't know how to say his last name there. But uh, <clears throat> basically, why do we care what a church council 500 years after Christ decided was heresy in the first place? So, um, I mean, there's. I think he's referring to the Second Council of Orange there. Maybe he's referring to the Council of Carthage. Um yeah, nice. You've got it highlighted there. Uh, so I'm not sure, but declared double predestination heresy. So that's Second Council of Orange, 529. Okay, and um, I've got some interesting things to say on that, but we're kind of still a long way of getting there. But Matthew, don't actually, I mean, there's some reasons to think that that council doesn't actually reject semi-Pelagianism. And so uh, this is sort of mind-blowing for many people. But uh, there's a few things. You've got to look at the historical factors. And, and the context in which it took place, there's already kind of validity concerns that it's an invalid council, um, but also that the beliefs of the Gallic monks, three monks I studied, John Cassian, Vincent of Lorenz, and Faustus of Rees, none of them, they're, they're not named in the Second Council of Orange, which when you have someone deemed heretical, they're named, okay? So like with Carthage, you get Pelagius. Uh, you don't have that in 529. Uh, and also, the beliefs of the Gallic monks don't fit with the canons. When you go through piece by piece, it it doesn't qualify. So something right. else is going on, I think, at in 529. And my own position, just sort of telling you what's what's coming is, I think that it's just a, a rehashing or a restatement of the condemnation of Pelagianism. Uh, so it and, and here's here's why you can know. Uh, th- this is what gets really fun. Uh, Leighton, you'll be familiar with this. Frequently, you've probably heard that the Second Council of Orange rejected semi-Pelagianism, right? Uh, okay, wait a second. But then Roger Olson and others say that the Roman Catholic Church was semi-Pelagian until the Protestant Reformation. So they 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 somehow forgot about Augustine and they embraced semi-Pelagianism, uh, but yet they rejected it at the Second Council of Orange in 520. Wait, 
Which, which, which where's that mean? Which button can you press? Uh, did they or, reject yeah. semi plagianism or did they accept? Or them? were they semi plagians? They they, the, the, they were semi plagians that accepted semi plagianism. You, yeah, you know, you, you just <laughs> you you can't you know you can't have both. So that's how you know something has gone wrong in the historical analysis uh, of this council, the second council of Orange, uh, because you can't have it both ways. So where yeah. where's how do you uh, release the tension? And um, my proposal is that, well, we've just misunderstood what the Second Council of Orange is all about. Well, and isn't it true, if I remember correctly, and, I, and I, I don't claim to be the scholar on the historical facts. That's why I have scholars on, by the way. So people who, who start chiding me online about pretending to be a, a historical scholar, I, I can't tell you how many times I've said I am not a, a scholar of the historical development of these things. That's why I had Dr. Bonner on. It's why I have you on. It's why I have Ken Wilson on. Um, I, I, I report you decide I, I'm, I'm a popularizer of the scholars, not, I don't claim to be the scholar. Um, so, and I've said that countless times on broadcasts. So maybe you probably even said it the first time you were on. I, I mean, I say it all the time. I don't know how, how else to say it, but, um, but the, the reason I asked this is because I remember hearing this. I think Adam Harwood, another scholar I had on may have referenced this, how at least one of the councils, I'm not sure which one also condemned things that would be consistent with Calvinism um, and, oh, yeah. and within held, the second council the of Orange. That were heretical. Yeah, yeah. The second, the Calvinists can't claim moral high ground on the second council of orange because you have a rejection of double predestination. And so that's in Calvin. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it's just really this weird thing where people who do their homework real should realize that there's no moral high ground on staking your flag on the second council of orange for multiple reasons, validity, theological. I mean, just, yeah. just, just forget about it. Drop it. Especially as Protestants, uh, you know, yeah, we don't, uh, we, we don't we're, hold to this we're high having church. some breaking, we're having some breaking news come out, Kurt. Um, it, it seems like you've, you've may have switched over to the other side or something. It, people are pointing out that, that you're part of Lake Geneva. It, it Geneva is <laughs> obviously, <laughs> so, that's so, obviously Calvinistic. What, what, what are you I, doing here? Yeah, Kurt? Geneva, what? Switzerland. Yeah. I, uh, I grew up at a Christian youth camp in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, Wisconsin. oh, okay, sure, sure, yeah, that's good, good cover. Gotcha. Okay, I saw Geneva. We all Hilarious. saw Geneva, and all the yeah. all these Pelagians that are watching this, they see Geneva and they start shaking in their boots because yeah, they're, they're you know get burned yeah, at the stake or whatever. Just you know, it's the kinda, word Geneva alone. Is, <laughs> the, the word Geneva makes us all. You gotta crawl, crawl under a blanket now. <laughs> <laughs> He's a double agent. All right, uh, fun stuff. Okay, let, let's back up. Let's kind of pull pull bigger picture now. Back back away a little bit, because I want our audience to learn a little bit about what your uh, work really focuses on. Um, and in my understanding, your work really focuses on the development of what has become known as semi Pelagianism. Yeah. Um, so back back up and give our audience kind of a picture. Great, of great. what your what your work really covers. Yeah, I'll even give a little bit of my personal journey in this and, and what Please. got me interested yes. to, to study here. So I was born and raised in, raised in a Christian home. And so I went to church every Sunday, paid attention in Sunday school. I knew all the answers. Uh, and I just say that very humbly, not in the sense like I knew the Sunday school answers, Jesus, Bible, God. But like I knew the biblical trivia, if you will. Uh, maybe I was that nerdy kid, the Christian kid in school. Uh, I could see that, Kurt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I went off to study uh, at Biola University, a Christian college, Southern California. Uh, I'm originally from Chicago, still live in the western suburbs of Chicago. I saw someone say they're from Racine, Keegan. Good to see you. We're close by. I hope you're a Cubs fan uh, in southern Wisconsin more than a Brewers fan, Keegan. Um, <clears throat> and at Biola, I was told by my Bible professors you're either a Calvinist or you're, you're an Arminian. Those are the two options. And uh, and in some ways, I mean, I'm not just like imposing. I, I know one professor who said that explicitly. Uh, and so most of the, the, the Bible profs were, were formed. Uh, there was one Arminian. All the other ones were Calvinists. Uh, but I enjoyed conversing with them even as a feisty student uh, that I was. But I never, I certainly was not a Calvinist, and I never even embraced the Arminian label for a number of reasons. And I'm happy to go into that, um, but, but don't have to right now. 
but I, I stumbled across this idea of semi-Pelagianism, and it sort of piqued my interest, this historical view where humans had this role to play, uh, you know, this active role. Uh, and so I began uh, in my master's work at King's College London to study the Gallic monks and to read more historical theology and uh, was starting to read the primary sources. I read John Cassian and uh, realized, well, wait a second, this idea that humans can take the first step devoid of grace. I mean, this is like the, uh, the theological dictionary definition that semi-Pelagianism is this idea that man can take the first step in the order salutis devoid of grace. And you heard MacArthur say unaided, right? So it's not like a secret. This is what people claim semi-Pelagianism is. But that's not Cassian's view at all for anybody who's reading the primary text. Nor and, is it Pelagius, nor is it seems to be Pelagius's view based upon right, his right. actual now, writings. Now, I mean, now yeah, this can, that's another this, discussion, but yeah. Right, it, it is another discussion, but also there's an interesting feature of like, what's the difference between external and internal grace, right? Uh, right, right, that right. Goes deeper. But for Cassian, Cassian says it's an internal working, like he describes this internal working. So like I said, Cassian's not even playing this ball game that even Augustine himself plays separating nature from grace. Multiple times, Augustine talks about how he tries to reconcile these two things, but in the end, the grace of God prevails. So he writes this right, in, right. in a letter to Simplician and uh, in his uh, retractions. I mean, elsewhere, he talks about his shift in thinking on this. And uh, so again, it's this false dichotomy uh, that you do not see in the Gallic monks who carry over, who carry over Eastern Greek theological traditions. Uh, so John Cassian's originally from the, the East and travels over to the West. Okay, but I'm getting off on that. So as I'm, uh, it, we can get more into that as well. But so my master's thesis looked at the Gallic monks, as I call them, the semi-Pelagians. And then for my doctoral work, I went deeper and studied their view of original sin. And because nothing, the only work that had been done on that was a, a six-page paper at an academic conference on John Cassian's view of original sin. And the six pages itself was very minimal, uh, and it was not a synthesis of the other Gallic monks, including Vincent and Faustus. Uh, and there are others as well, but these are the three most popular uh, fellows. And, and Faustus's work hasn't even been translated into English. And uh, so that's there's really this great work, De Grazia, uh, it, it, you know, on the grace of God by a, semi a so called semi Pelagian uh, to, doing a work on the grace of God. It's really fascinating stuff. So we need to get that over into English. So that's what well, led uh, me to, <laughs> to study. Well, that, 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 I just wanted to comment on that because that, even that point alone, the fact that so much of these, these writings and teachings from back in the ancient councils and discussions. A lot of them have been, in a sense, sitting in theological libraries for generations in, in written Latin and other languages that, that haven't really been delved into with all that much depth from the scholars because of the fact that they're not as accessible. And given the fact that just since the mid-90s, we have internet at our fingertips, we have yeah. many more people who have access to these documents, you're getting now more and more translations coming out where we're kind of... Uh, this treasure trove of theology geek uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. material. Uh, and, 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 and it, by the way, if you look up the word theology geek in a dictionary, you will see a picture of Kurt right there. Because, <laughs> I mean, he is, I mean, anybody who's doing Gallic monks uh, on the doctrine of original sin and semi-Pelagianism and, and translating it from the original languages in order to get, this is the quintessential theology geek of theology yeah. geeks. And so we're honored, really. And we all bow. Who, to your your uh, your theology geekness, uh, someone who uh, smiles sure. when talking about original sin as well, right? Who oh. smiles oh, like yes. about the fall yeah, of you humanity. Love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you could you you, you, just, you just walk around the EPS meetings and you'll see Kurt over in the little corners with different people, just smiling with his biggest smile, talking about his favorite topic with all of his theology geek friends and and me, me, oftentimes right in the midst of it. So yeah. yeah. So all right, I'm sorry to, sorry to interrupt your flow there. Go, go proceed no, on, my friend. Uh, Let's see, where did I leave off? Uh, talking about Faustus, um, you, you had brought up this idea that we're living in a time where there's, you know, there had been works sitting without being translated over. I'll even go another degree further. Works lost to history have been recovered. 
So in, in 1938, a fellow named William Mountain discovered uh, some manuscripts, um, which are a collection of Augustine's uh, writings on Christology. And But this was a collection of sayings composed by Vincent of Lorenz. And why is this, you know, why do we care what Vincent thinks about Augustine? Well, you're like, wait, why do we care what Vincent thinks about Augustine? And what you see is you can compare what Vincent did in copying uh, Augustine's positions from On the Predestination of the Saints. Now, in On the Predestination of the Saints, Augustine makes this argument that in the, in the way that Jesus was predestined, so too we as individuals are predestined. You can, you can read this. Uh, on the Predestination of the Saints, it's, it, you could sit it, you could read it in an afternoon. You just sit down in one reading and go. What you see in Vincent's Christological Florilegium, there's a technical term, that's what this writing is, discovered in 1938, you see that Vincent has cut out the individual predestination uh, 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 analogy or corollary, corollary that Augustine does. And instead, he sort of just cuts out and, and takes the Christological statements of Augustine. And, and you're like, there's, there's something to this. And the reason why I'm particularly interested in this is because there are some scholars who try to make Vincent sympathetic to Augustinianism. And I say, wait, hold the brakes. You can't just ignore what Vincent has done by taking scissors to the predestination of the saints. Uh, I'm using an analogy, but right, taking right. scissors and cutting out those specific individual predestinations. So for me, I see what Vincent does is he, he creates a Historia Salutis instead of the Ordo Salutis. And so Vincent doesn't play Augustine's game. He doesn't want to play Augustine's game. And there's, I, I would argue, Vincent thinks the later Augustine is not in line with church tradition, which is why you have Vincent's commonatorium, I think, make a couple slighted attacks, at uh, uh, veiled attacks at uh, later Augustinianism. And I draw the distinction between later and earlier because Augustine changed his mind. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. And even, yeah, and even, even, I think, even Calvinistic scholars, historians confess that, that he did change his, his right. views and even confess that he is the first, at least in church history on record, to teach some of the more Calvinistic predestinarian views. Um, and so that, 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 that becomes the question of then, then why does it, does it take until the fifth century for uh, a former Manichaean uh, you know, guy who doesn't speak Greek from Africa to introduce this new uh, way of interpreting the text that happens to align with what the Manichaeans were saying, and he was a former Manichaean for a decade. And so th th shouldn't there be maybe some questioning about what may have influenced the reason he shifted from orthodoxy? Yeah, I don't so, know if, if that particular scholar gets into that. but that Yeah, so now I, in my scholarship, I have not analyzed that subject in, in particular. I know that there are others who have, like Wilson. I haven't had right, time right. to go, th go through all, all the work. But I will say this. I did have a chapter on... Augustine's view of original sin, and I analyzed his view of Romans 5.12, of course. A lot of people know he had a, a, a mistranslation, uh, or rather a poor translation of the Greek. Uh, so I did look into this on, on multiple counts. Even his reading of John Chrysostom, I mean, he couldn't read Greek. He had to depend on a contemporary. Chrysostom was a contemporary, so he, he had to read a Latin translation of Chrysostom in order to understand him. And so the, these are um, these are challenges and difficulties if we want to uh, analyze Augustine's thoughts. And, and we should say that there are shortcomings in his thinking as a result of some of these challenges that he had. Uh, so now the, the, the still the point remains, can you can you make uh, you know, can you make a doctrine of original sin even in spite of the translation issue? Well, you, you can. The, the question is just how much merit it has. Um, and of course, original sin is, is just a collection of sub tenants. So, you know, when people, and I get this and when I tell them I studied original sin, people say, oh yeah, well, you can't deny the doctrine of original sin. You know, it's like, well, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, just a little. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you saw my interview with Adam Harwood, but he, he enlightened me to something that I was not aware of. He had told me, he said, Leighton, did you know that uh, Martin Luther actually calls Eurek Zwingli a Pelagian? 
because Yurik Zwingli has a different view of inherited guilt than what Luther holds to. Um, and I just thought that was the funniest thing I'd heard uh, in a long time, just because even of the two, two of the leading reformers, both of which hold to more of a Calvinistic interpretation of the text, um, have a, a differing view on the, the nature of inherited guilt. And, and one of them calls the other one a Pelagian, the, the whole boogeyman uh, fallacy. Yeah, l- let once me again, give a, a perfect there. example that hits on semi-Pelagianism. So again, the boogeyman concept uh, or just just straight up ad hominem, right? If we're going to use a technical term. Oh, it term. is. Yeah. So, yeah. so the term semi-Pelagian wasn't around in the fifth century. The Gallic monks would have absolutely rejected this, identifying with this label. All three of them explicitly condemn Pelagius. All right. Some calling them even in traditional terms, like you know. Sometimes the church fathers used. Uh, Harsh very language. Yeah. bombastic language. So they do this with Pelagius. Uh, so the term semi-Pelagian, getting to your point, Leighton, about how you see this with Calvinists. Now, granted, not all Calvinists are like this, but you do with some of the leaders, leading representatives, you do see this from time to time. Well, guess what? The first person to use the term semi-Pelagian was none other than Theodore Beza, the first disciple, one of the first disciples of John Calvin. So yeah, when it like when, when it fifteen like fifteen seventy seven around there or something the, like the that. It was in the Jesuit controversies. Uh, so a little, oh my, little yeah. later, yeah, yeah. But, yeah just but, a little, little later. Uh, but what's when you said earlier in in our discussion here that uh, you see this in the Reformed tradition? You know, I couldn't help but smile because <laughs> it goes all the way back to Beza with regard to the term semi Pelagian. Um, yeah, and and obviously Beza's goal in saying semi-Pelagianism is like saying semi-Nazism in our world yeah. or, or semi-Hitlerism yeah, or something yeah. like that, because you've got, you've already got the established boogeyman, regardless of whether Pelagius really taught the things he was accused of teaching. That's another, uh, that's a whole nother discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, what Pelagianism has become to be known, everybody sees it as a toxic waste dump of, Hey, we don't want to go anywhere there because after yeah. all, that's ba- basically saying uh, we're purely humanistic and we don't even need God. Deism could be fine. God could go take a vacation and we'd be all okay because after all, we're just all all self-reliant here kind of folks. I mean, that, that's the extremist version of the way it's painted. And nobody, and, 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 and as Dr. Bonner pointed out, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an accusation of pride. It's basically saying you're trying to take credit for something that's not due to you. Obviously, that is gonna. That is a big old bully stick. You can, you can, arrogance and pride. If I can just condemn you as being arrogant and prideful, because you're claiming something that actually God effectually causes, um, then then I can use that boogeyman battering ram on you all day long without getting into any kind of nuance. Of it's a scare tactic, uh, yeah. and you know we shouldn't be afraid of the truth. We shouldn't be afraid to learn of other positions. Uh, even if we ultimately disagree with them. But I, you know, when people use these scare tactics to keep others from studying or learning or exploring, uh, I, I I really take issue with that. And that's why we're losing people. Uh, people are, that's why people are leaving the Christian faith. I mean, part of what I do in my apologetics ministry uh, through my, my Veracity Hill ministry is I host a multi-view conference. And so I have different views, some which I, you know, really disagree with so this last conference we did in march was on hell and i even had a universalist i'm not a universalist uh, but i had a universalist come and defend the position because we should not be scared of these things but when the christian church plays the boogeyman card in a number of arenas then we don't talk about the issues on the minds of youth we don't talk about sexual ethics and in fact the christian church is full of hypocrites okay yeah. When, when was the last time, again, Leighton, I don't know your personal background, your, your work situation all that much, but when was the last time a Christian pastor t- taught on divorce and remarriage? Hmm. We, we are full yeah. of hypocrites in the Christian church, and that's why we're losing people. All right, I'll get off my soapbox yeah. here on apologetics. And but, but the point is, when we use scare tactics, we don't talk about the issues that people are thinking about. We don't talk about issues that we should be talking about, and we just need to be real with people and let them explore these different positions. I would, I would far and away have someone reject the historical Adam if they are following Jesus. 
Now, that's not my own view, but I would far and away prefer someone say, yeah, Adam didn't really exist. But you know what? I, I'm reading my scriptures on a, on a weekly, maybe even daily basis. I'm, you know, walking with Jesus. To me, that is way better. The orthopraxy far trumps the orthodoxy on that issue, yeah. hands down. Well, and, 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 to, and to Piper's credit, I, I played a clip from a, a woman who called into his station or called into his show and was pretty much saying, I can't, I can't swallow Calvinism. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll, have to, I'll have to leave God and the faith altogether if this is true. And he, to his credit, said, I would rather you be an Arminian Christian than not a Christian at all. I, you, yep. know, it, you know, and he said, there's a lot of good people. And he, he, he cites from Tozer and Lewis and others that, that were not Calvinists, but still faithful followers. And that's to his credit that he was willing to go there. But you don't, you don't see many people, it seems like, at least on social media, willing to be that uh, open to the mere Christianity kind of approach to these kinds of issues, that it's all or nothing. And, and I, I think it's so wise. I know Mike Lacona, who you've worked with and still probably uh, uh, work with on a lot of different things, and uh, William Lane Craig's the same way, um, really approaching um, the, the apologetic arguments from that perspective, because you're trying to get people to come to uh, uh, faith in Christ, not to uh, perfect doctrinal fidelity on every you know controversial issue that's out there. I want to I want to raise my hand here because I I really want to bring this up. Um, so you're perhaps familiar with Tyler Vela and his. Uh, you know, departure yes. from the Christian faith. I want to bring this back to Calvinism because there are, it's a document, I'm happy to document, a number of public deconversions uh, have occurred from people with Reformed backgrounds. Yeah, so we've played a, a lot point, of those. Yeah, we've played a, a lot question. of those on here, yeah. Yeah, so I want, to, I want to talk about Tyler's situation because this was just two weeks ago. I got into a brief Twitter discussion with him. Um, and, you know, he has said, you know, I didn't leave because of my Calvinism. But I want to read for you some tweets, uh, and I took screenshots because I wasn't sure if he was going to delete the tweets. Yeah, um, and you can I'll, share. I don't know if you can share them or not, but I can put them up. They're there on my lap. Share. They're on my oh, okay, laptop. Gotcha. Actually, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, no, no, no worries. Go I'm ahead. happy to provide links. Um, all yeah. right, so you know, this is Father's Day. Father's Day sermons. No matter your relationship with your dad, your heavenly Father loves you even more. The Bible tells us so. Now, this is Tyler, no longer a Christian. He said, um, "My father didn't try to drown me." burn me, infect me with plague, or have my siblings stone me to death for standing on the same ground he was. I mean, clearly Tyler's become bitter at the, the, the biblical God. He said, so there's that. Also, my earthly father wasn't even as remotely hidden and aloof and absentee. In fact, the biblical God is exactly like an absentee deadbeat dad that requires single mother church to actually do all the work. Hmm, weird. This is this is Tyler Vela, the former passionate Calvinist, who continues to appear on Calvinist programs to defend Calvinism as consistent with biblical I debated, teaching. Yeah, Braxton Hunter and I debated Sean Cole and Tyler Vela. That was one so of my first public debates. Yeah, I, I, I put him in a corner, and he dodged the question and then hasn't responded. If he thinks Calvinism is biblical Christianity, then the Christian God is not just. The Christian God is a deadbeat dad. So that means the Calvinist God is not just. If you're Tyler Vela and you're saying these things about the biblical God. Right. And yeah, because he believes the Bible is Calvinistic and he still right. defends that. He'll get on Twitter and come against me all the time. But he can't you know, say the, the Calvinist time. God is unjust because he hasn't been programmed that way, right? To think that yeah. way as a Calvinist. So this really is an inherent contradiction if Tyler thinks that about the biblical right. God. If you believe the biblical God is a Calvinistic version of God, and you believe the biblical God is the deadbeat, dad, unjust, and unkind, then what you've clearly said is the Calvinistic version of God it's is unjust, unjust and, and deadbeat, unloving, dad. uncaring, yeah. absent. Yep. Yes. So, yep. so he, he totally dodged. I, I asked him to uh, you know answer these questions, and he he just dodged. But I didn't yeah. want to push it further because I know we we all we do have to be sensitive to people's personal walks. But I'm also willing to call this out publicly because Tyler's put himself out there publicly, uh, and so it, in that sense, yeah, it's and, fair game. And, and you can have a genuine desire and love for somebody and want them to come to faith, and and I genuinely want that for Tyler. I've prayed for him uh, genuinely, uh, messaged him after his his coming out of deconversion in a in a very kind way, and he he expressed kindness in return. Um, and so uh, it, it is not to be just purely vitriolic, but when he's putting out vitriolic 
accusations against God, uh, the God of Scripture, uh, we have every right and should, I think, do as what we saw the apostles do in their time, what we saw Jesus do in his time against the Pharisaical views, is to stand up very firmly and say um, what you're teaching is uh, false, it's wrong, um, and what you're, the conclusions you've come to are not based upon uh, the actual teachings of Scripture, but based upon a misinformed interpretation of the text. Yeah. Um, and so that that's why we, we do what we do. I, I want to uh, talk about B.J. Allen's comment. He doesn't like talking about the link between Reformed and deconversions uh, because people try and use this as some sort of club. Let me let me say this, uh, B.J., good, good to have you here as well watching. Um, I'll have to think about this more, but I'm as of today, I'm certainly willing to say there's not a necessary link between Calvinism and rejection of the Christian faith. But there is a... Uh, there, there may be a tendency, there might be a contingent connection between people who perceive that the Calvinist God is far off and unloving uh, and, and them ultimately being uh, led astray from the faith. Let me give you a counterexample to Tyler, okay? Uh, a, a brother of ours, Chris Date, and uh, who has yeah. been going through some uh, trials and tribulations. That's all I'll say. Um, uh, those who follow him maybe know about his situation. Uh, trials and tribulations there, but is handling that much differently than Tyler has. Uh, so, yeah, Calvinism doesn't necessarily entail departure from the Christian faith. But when you see certain signs, indicators, tendencies, that is that can be sort of a warning sign uh, that something has uh, gone wrong. And, well, and I would and, think and, and, has. And people need it. to understand this. This is an intellectual argument. This is a, a this is an argument. A debate argument, not trying to be overly emotional or personal about any one individual and their whatever they're going through. It's it's a, it's a logical argument. If Calvinism is false, which we obviously believe it is, but if it's false, and anyone, whether it's Tyler, whether it's um, the Cademan's call, you know, Derek Webb, uh, Megan Phelps, um, or the many others, Max Maxwell, Paul Maxwell, I think his name is. Uh, former writer for Desiring God Ministries with under Piper, uh, who have deconverted now. Um, the other guy who wrote Joshua Lewis, or what's his name? Um, anyway, there's a plethora of these former Calvinists who have now deconverted. Um, and when they actually cite, as Megan Phelps did, um, as Derek Webb did, cite Calvinistic tenets as motivations or reasons or excuses for their deconversion, yeah. then wouldn't it be accurate of us and right of us to confront those points that we disagree with. Of course it would. And that's what we're trying to say. We're not trying to say every Calvinist obviously deconverts because not obviously every Calvinist has ever deconverted. That's not what we're saying. We're saying if there are people deconverting because of the claims of Calvinism, then we have every right and should as non-Calvinistic Christians to confront those claims that we see as false. And in addition to that, the second part of that argument is if Calvinism is true, then all these deconversions were ordained by God and these people were not elect. And so therefore, no matter how rank, quote unquote, rank Arminianism or provisionism becomes, it is all in accordance with God's divine plan and decree. And no less people are going to be elected and saved because of our, quote unquote, error. So Calvinists don't have any fear of less people being saved and converted or anybody deconverting because of the false teachings of Arminians or provisionists. There's no basis in their system. That's not true of us, however. We do have a basis on which to say false doctrines can lead people down, uh, to, to, uh, to down a road of disbelief um, and therefore should be called out and because it can have that kind of etern internal impact on people. The Calvinist doesn't believe that, so they don't have a ground on which, in my estimation, to call out false teachings or what they believe to be false teachings as potentially uh, causing people to deconvert or causing people uh, not to be elected or causing people not to be saved because that doesn't exist on their system. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out as well. All right, we're 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 going down, uh, de departing from our search for semi-Pelagians. Uh, well, that was fun. That was a fun rabbit trail. Now let's pull it, it, back on the main and path. It, and, it was yeah. worth it was worth uh, exploring. I think because there's a you know there's a few things I wanted to say about that connection. Um, and even as I, as we're talking, I'm remembering of our conversation from seven years ago on on the problem of suffering 
and we talk about Job, Job accuses God of being unjust. And uh, this is, I think, a tendency of Calvinists who believe that God brings about all the suffering. Uh, that This was Job's error. So for those who maybe don't know my own positions, Job has bad theology. We should not embrace Job's theology because he makes an error. He accuses, he, he wants a mediator between him and God. And he accuses him, he says, you've painted a target on my back. And so th these are things we ought not to do. And uh, it, it's only later, we need to have the narrator's theology in mind uh, to, to come away with what really is the teaching of that wisdom literature. All right, uh, so let's let's go hunting for more semi-Pelagians. We, we can't find any so far. Um, and uh, even the Gallic monks, they held to this robust view of grace. Um, John Cassian talks about the internal working of grace. Faustus of Rees talks about the prima grazia, the first grace. So this idea that humans can take an unaided step uh, devoid of grace, we don't find it in the fifth century. Um, maybe we find it in contemporary discussions, but I'd wager the people who are filling out these surveys, bringing it back to MacArthur, you know, these aren't educated persons. I mean, have them take a survey on the Trinity. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> see what they say on that and see how heretical they are. We, we shouldn't hold lay persons responsible for, you know, these robust theological doctrines. Uh, it's just not their bread and butter like uh, us theology geeks. And yeah, so we, yeah. we shouldn't be appalled like MacArthur is appalled uh, with, with all the semi-Pelagians around. Uh, but okay, so I'm happy to continue hunting for semi-Pelagians. Maybe they're in the Southern Baptist Convention. I know yeah. there was drama on the traditional statement a number of years ago. And, and that's yeah, why... Yeah, that's both, a, Moeller, both Moeller, and, Moeller, who is a Calvinist, and Roger Olson, who is an Arminian, uh, referred to the traditional statement as at least leaning towards uh, semi-Pelagianism. So this is how I met Adam Harwood, uh, because I was at ETS. I remember actually when I met him. We were sitting in the back row of a, of a, of a talk. I don't remember the talk, but I remember meeting Adam. Because uh, I can't remember. I think I had just started my PhD work. And um, I had discovered through Adam that there were these Southern Baptists, of which I'm, I'm not a Southern Baptist, but uh, certainly friends with... Uh, my Christian well, brother. of course, you you swim in Lake Geneva, so we, we know that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and I had learned that there is this faction, if you will, a faction of Southern Baptists who who hold to this idea that humans have free will without all these ad hoc regenerative grace, or uh, even depending upon how you define partial it, partial regeneration. Uh, yes, yeah. super added uh, post fall. So there was this faction. All of a sudden, uh, my eyes lit up. I was like. Here they are, the guys I'm reading from the fifth century, and and I'm staring at them. I mean, these are these are my people, uh, and so yeah, that's when I did, I re, I learned more about the traditional statement, and I discovered you and and Braxton and and others, um, but that was my first uh, exposure to contemporary quote unquote semi Pelagians in the flesh, um, and and realizing hey, we're not semi Pelagians at all. Now Adam has written a, a paper that was published. Uh, yeah. Say no, traditionals are, are not semi-Pelagians. I think, and this is a, just a gentle correction on uh, to Adam, and I've talked to him about this, that he he's willing to seed the definition that this is semi-Pelagian and, and then says the traditional statement isn't that. I reject the definition altogether and say there's no That's such another thing. another way of approaching it, yeah. Yeah, it's just... Yeah, it's more like the Bonner approach, that this is a myth. This doesn't even, yeah. ex this doesn't even exist it's, because... It's the boogeyman. Yeah. The boogeyman doesn't right, exist. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, 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 but I think what Adam's work does is it says, even if we concede this definition, we the still don't... The still... Yeah, the yeah. traditionalists don't match up with the traditional or the most uh, widely accepted uh, and, uh, definition of this term we still reject that. And so on both fronts, uh, the, 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 the argument fails. And so the, yeah, I think that's, yep. that's wise to have both fronts because of two defeaters, you know, in a, in a debate's better yep. than one. So you got two and, defeaters. And I, I, I really want to encourage your followers, Layton and other Southern Baptists in this, what I call faction. Cause if you, it's, it's a small, you know, group, uh, relative to the whole denom, uh, 
I really want to encourage you guys to read John Cassian's conferences because you will you will not feel like you're reading Augustine, but you're going to get a robust view of divine grace. And so for the, the reform that accuse the Southern Baptists of holding to an insufficient view of grace, you guys are going to have certain Uno cards that you can start playing, you know, reverse Uno cards uh, that you can start playing mm -hmm. on the Calvinists. And uh, it really, to have a Western source of Eastern thinking, so, so you both, you get the geographic location of you're in the West, but you have also this robust Greek tradition behind you. Yeah. It's, not, it's not like the Southern Baptist view, uh, the traditionalist view, happened overnight or happened uh, in the 1800s or the 1900s uh, or the 2000s. There is a tradition you guys can source and use to say, hey, this is what we believed on anthropology in the fall. And you can't just say it's, it's a, you know, this innovation. You can't say it's a novelty because here it is in the Christian tradition. Well, I've even heard you say, you know, you could refer to me as an early Augustinian because his earliest writings after coming out of uh, Manichaeanism and debating uh, the Manichaeans, uh, he's debating in favor of free will uh, when he's debating the Manichaeans, as we've read here on, on the program. Yeah. So, so uh, there's a disciple of Augustine who lived in uh, modern day France, Roman Gaul, named Prosper of Aquitaine. And Prosper, uh, who admires uh, Augustine, he writes to him and says, hey, there are some fellows who are using your writings against you. <laughs> The Gallic monks, very likely, Prosper, he doesn't mention, but very likely, he has in mind John Cassian. That that Cassian, now this is my own view, um, we don't know for certain because it's not explicit, but Cassian uh, the the writings of Augustine. Uh, the early writings. The early writings of Augustine right. against yeah. the later Augustine and through Prosper, right, as Prosper is engaging. Because Prosper came to write a, a, a work called Against the Conferencer. Contra uh, Cassian, right? And um, so what, what's great about that is you can actually compare Cassian's writings versus his, his critic. Uh, you can't always do that in historical theology. And you can see how Prosper does a terrible job at conveying, at steel manning, to use an internet lingo, right, right, when right, he's right. steel man, he just straw mans Cassian left and right. And so you can actually see Prosper does a terrible job. But uh, back to the, the, the point here about early and later Augustine, that Cassian and the Gallic monks use the earlier Augustine's writings against Augustinianism. Uh, so, yeah, fascinating stuff. And yeah, I, and, I, and I, what it really shows you is that it, it, history repeats itself. It really, it really does. Um, every time I talk to another scholar or I go and read some of the sources for myself, I, I think this. I, I Oh, my gosh, this is happening uh, exactly the same way. Um, uh, when I was listening to Dr. Bonner talk, I was just like, oh, I can relate to that. Good night. You know, saying this and then being interpreted as this, how in the world did you interpret this statement as that? I mean, where did you get that? And, um, you know, and, and then, and then being, uh, an, anathematized based upon the false statement versus the actual statement. Um, and, and it, it's, it happens over and over and over again. And, and what I've pointed out in articles and other places is why would you follow the example of the type of men who led us into the Inquisitions and the, the type of men who use the kinds of language that, that mark the worst parts of, the Christian, of Christian history versus those Christians who are often the unknown, uh, I think, unsung heroes like the Balthazar Hubmeyers of the Reformation, for example, and others whose whose lives actually reflected that of Christ um, in the way they behaved, in the way they treated those who dissented against them, instead of burning them at the stake, actually showing them grace and mercy and patience, actually um, taught uh, religious liberties, um, actually spoke out for uh, believers' baptism, um, and was thrown into a, a or actually burned at the stake, and his wife was thrown into a river by Zwingli, no less. Um, the, speaking of the Hubmeyers, um, wh why would you ignore those who actually lived the type of, of faith that we 
you know, are, are advocating, that even good Calvinists like Piper advocate for, this is the kind of life you should live. And we, we virtually, it seems, looking back through the history, seem to prop up and highlight these people who were crass and mean and burned people to stake and were horrible because they were the theological bullies of the day who won over in the, the, the court of public opinion because in that day, the bullies are the ones who ruled the world, so to speak. And so it seems like when you look back throughout Christian history, it's like we have all of these people who we're just like cringing at. Of, oh, oh, gosh, I can't believe he did that, or I can't believe he said that. And we're going, can we look below the surface of those popular names and look at the, the stream of faithful Christians who held to theological beliefs that we could be proud of today and, the, and, the, and, the, and live their lives in a way that we would actually want to exemplify and hold up? Anyway, that's my little uh, soapbox. But it seems like a lot of your work uncovers these types of people throughout history as well. Yeah. Uh, you, my research did come across a number of folks, uh, as I've already mentioned, Prosper and Theodore Beza. And, and yeah, you can see how they these bullies use the ad hominems. They create straw men. Uh, to uh, to paint their critics, uh, their rivals, if you will. Uh, now, what's interesting about Prosper uh, is this, though. Uh, as he ages, he, uh, he moves on from Roman Gaul and goes to Rome. And uh, you can see through his own writings that he softens his view. He even softens his hard Augustinian view into a softer Augustinianism. Uh, so as he goes to Rome and... and broadens his horizons he, he meets more people of course he moved out he moved out of the cage stage in other words <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean that's 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 very right i mean uh because he he was forced to encounter the the broader tradition um and he was you know he was just a layman at, at the time when uh he was engaging with john cassian um no star wars relation for someone who had made a comment about uh cassian andor <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, he does. He does soften his view, um, and I, I highly encourage Calvinists to soften their views because Calvinism is such a small minority when we're looking at the Christian tradition theologically, and when we look at the the demographics of the Christian Church, that Calvinists no. make up a sliver. And so uh, I want to invite my Calvinist brethren to consider reading outside of Calvinist sources. I see this so often. Calvinists read only Calvinists, especially the presuppositionalists. It's uh, Yeah, it's an echo uh, chamber. And it, well, it even is. within that sliver of Calvinists, you have so many different um, groups even within them. You got the Bruce Wares who deny limited atonement, who's also, or they're also called, he's also called a Pelagian by some of his, uh, you know, five-pointer types, the yeah. A.W. Pink types versus the MacArthur types. Uh, I mean, there, there are all different kinds of Calvinist, even within that relatively tiny sliver of the, the mass of, of Christian history and the, the differing views. Um, and you're right, there, there tends to be, and I was in it, kind of an echo chamber in our, in our current culture of, I only listen to podcasts from the, the reformed group, you know, that reformed crowd. I, I've got my, I've got my, uh, you know, my Vody Bacham. I've got my John MacArthur. I've it's got almost like, Ch a, it's like Chandler a resume maybe. or like, a, yeah. it's like, it's like a contest Who, who's more reformed than the other, right? Can you grow a longer beard? Can you do, I mean, I, I, yeah. yeah. It, it tends to be that way, and and I think when you when you step out of that echo chamber and you really begin to study uh, the history of the development of these doctrines, if nothing else, you become a lot more, um, I guess maybe patient with and or understanding of those who might disagree with your particular view. I, I I've had the same thing happen when it comes to doctrines that I still hold dear, that I, I see the development of the doctrine or what's you know, transpired, and I go, oh, well, I, okay, now I can see why, for example, Chris Date holds to an annihilationist view. That makes sense to me based upon understanding. I can understand why Idol Killer Warren holds to a, a dynamic perspective and the philosophical explanations behind it. I, I get where he's coming from now that I've studied it a little bit more. Um, I don't have to agree with their conclusions necessarily, um, but I can understand where they're coming from to the point where I can, quote unquote, tolerate. A, a, diff, a distinction and a difference between us um, because I actually take the time not to just do the no, 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 I'm not listening because you're a heretic kind of thing or hey, I'm going to label you and dismiss you before I even hear you. 
I'm, I'm going to be willing to have open dialogue and conversations and realize that people come to different conclusions, sometimes for pretty good reasons. And maybe we should actually take the time to hear them out and maybe consider those things, if nothing else, to help your view to be strengthened um, if you're willing to listen. So that's a, yeah, Idol Killer, shout out there. There he goes. <laughs> shout out from Idol Killer. Um, and um, so I, I wanted to kind of bring this somewhat the plane to land, so, so to speak. We're over our hour mark. And so I, I want you, the audience to, to hear kind of some of the conclusions that you drew from your research. Um, you know, what, what is the practical application of this for Southern Baptist, for example, you've mentioned, even though there are a lot of people who are listening are not necessarily Southern Baptist, but um, those that are in that, that range of, you know, non-denominational, you know, independent Baptist, that, that kind of a group that's typically lines up with where we hold to as provisionist, what, what does your uh, research, how does that help us today practically? Yeah. A uh, very good question. Um, I'll I'll try to keep the answer short. Uh, and I've mentioned a few things already in our discussion uh, about this, about you know the importance of reading John Cassian. You might come away yeah. with uh, tools to your tool belt on how to communicate what provisionists believe about how grace functions. Uh, but in my research, so I, I primarily study the doctrine of of original sin, and so w- what I came o- came away with was that. Uh, Semi-Pelagianism is a terrible anachronistic term. Uh, it, it does a poor job at describing these 5th century monks from southern France, Roman Gaul, so Gallic theology. And that semi-Pelagianism is a, is a boogeyman. Okay, so that's sort of out of the way, and that can get out of the way fairly quickly, uh, although it just seems to be like a, a continuing thing. It's like beating a dead horse. Uh, <clears throat> but on original sin, that we... that provisionists shouldn't be afraid to say yes i agree with the doctrine of original sin yeah uh but what do we mean by that right so we should be willing to say just like uh, we say depravity i have no problem saying men are depraved but what do you mean by that that's right yeah 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 Yeah. what what do we mean by it so and, and it's important because then we can get into what what we don't mean uh now again i I currently don't identify as a provisionist. I think I'm open to it, but we'd have to have more discussions at any rate. So I, I'm speaking on behalf of myself here from my doctoral research looking at the Gallic monks, uh, that we, we deny the inheritance of the very guilt of Adam. We accept the consequences of Adam's choice. We deny total inability uh, to, for men to perform an objectively good action before God. Of course, that doesn't make it meritorious for salvation. Far from it. The fall has so affected men that they are separated from God. Uh, They die. Uh, They have a propensity to sin. Uh, And and the inevitability of sinning was a point that Cassian embraced, uh, that ultimately all men sin. Uh, And so this idea that we could possibly live a perfect life, even Cassian would have said, nah, uh, not, not, not possible. Uh, and uh, so we can affirm a number of tenets within the doctrine of original sin. And so I came away uh, throughout my studies sort of shifting my view on that. I sort of pushed back. And so I see some people push back. They say, well, I embrace ancestral sin. You know, I reject original sin, but I agree with ancestral sin. I actually wouldn't even recommend that um, because I'm not so sure that the Eastern Greek theologians that I've read on that hold... Uh, to uh, intellect, um, but in the West we do have more systematic models, and so I should I I, I recommend just saying yes, I agree with original sin, but here's well, it's the, it's, it's like biblical doctrines. Okay, somebody says, do you believe in the doctrines of grace? Well, yes, I believe in the doctrines of yeah. grace. Here here are the doctrines that I believe about God's grace. Do you believe in the doctrine of God's sovereignty? Well, of course I believe in the doctrine of God's sovereignty. Here's how I would define Do you believe in the doctrine of human depravity? Or do you believe in the doctrine, you know, whatever it is, yeah, yes, we're not denying that we believe in that doctrine. The whole debate has always been, even among reform circles, within reform circles, if you study this stuff, this is one of the reasons it gets so frustrating when people on Twitter and social media begin to treat this like it's a black and white issue. And just like it, there's no color of gray, even among the reform tradition with regard to many of these questions, especially with regard to atonement, for goodness sake, as, as demonstrated by David Allen. There's so many nuanced views 
among the Reformed tradition. The, the, the concept of even pre-faith regeneration, I learned at EPS from a Reformed uh, scholar talking about how prior to Dort, it was never referred to as regeneration preceding faith. Uh, that, that developed f uh, after Dort. And so it's just things like this, that you begin to study these things. And then and what, it, what education does is it begins to soften you a little bit to go, okay, um, maybe Paul didn't use the King James Version kind of a mindset, okay? Maybe, maybe a little bit of education can kind of help me here to realize that maybe my hardline view on this particular point sounds a lot like the flat earth people. Um, when, I, when I really begin to study the material that's out there from the scholars and educators, that the scholars and educators aren't just these raging liberals that are trying to uh, you know, steal my you know, innocence, but instead maybe, maybe they have some valid points that I should consider before I draw hard conclusions and throw out an otherwise good brother out of my convention and out of the kingdom because yep. they come to a different conclusion than I do. Um, that, that, again, another one of my soapboxes, but I, I think that that's a very practical side of this is to help people to understand these, these distinctions and these differences. Yep. Um, I, I start a couple of things here. I, um, uh, Keegan is saying, where, where can you find Kirk's work on original sound? Uh, for those who are researchers, you can actually hunt through some databases and find my doctoral dissertation. Uh, I believe I also have some of my papers, uh, some of which are on my doctoral research, some which have new material and others not on that. Uh, you can go to veracityhill.com, B-E-R-A-C-I-T-Y, Veracity Habitual Truthfulness, veracityhill.com. Uh, and uh, I'll double check that I've got links readily available. I know I share stuff out on social media, so you can follow me there and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And, and um, also before we and close- And I'll go back and add a link. I'll go back and add a link to the show notes on YouTube here for Veracity Hill for those that didn't get that if you're driving somewhere. Um, I, I will add that into the show notes here, so. Uh, but before the plane absolutely lands, um, to use your analogy, I do wanna say this, that I have, I have a, an open invitation for a formal debate, not just for this Ron fellow, uh, but even for James White, for a, for any Reformed theologian, any Reformed speaker who wants to debate semi-Pelagianism, whether, and in particular, I'd be interested in the historical view, but I'm even willing to debate whether provisionists are semi-Pelagian, are semi-Pelagians, uh, are Americans semi-Pelagians. I'm willing to even debate those things uh, because, you know, they'll even say yes on those. And I'll say no, because there, you know, in my view, there is no such thing as semi-Pelagianism. So I'm happy to debate any reformed theologian, pastor, speaker on this, the subject matter. So if James I, White... I don't, who, suspect, I don't suspect any of them are going to be lining up for that, to be honest. Um, there, once you really begin to study the re and you do the research on this stuff, it just becomes so overwhelmingly... Yeah. obvious that there has been a, a complete rewriting of history by the reformed tradition um it, that that they they get embarrassed by it um and I, again i know i'm projecting there in a sense of saying you know we, we can get embarrassed by our own theological tradition as well i we both can get embarrassed by different things throughout history i, I recognize that and i've i've acknowledged that in other broadcasts but but on this particular point it is, it is so overwhelmingly, in my estimation, embarrassing for the Calvinist when they really begin to unpack the history of this development of these issues. That, uh, that even to the point where I know Michael Horton, after being called out uh, by Contrell and other uh, Arminians, that he took out his final, he'd, he'd gotten some things, I think, from probably from Gill, where he quoted all these early church fathers as if they were favorable to Calvinism. <laughs> and and Cottrell and all these other guys just went through and pulled out every single one of the actual context of every one of their quotes and just demonstrated how utterly ridiculous um, Gill's uh, I mean, quotes Calvinists, were. On, on the metric, on the ruler of Calvinism, Calvinists should think that the church fathers were heretics, absolute heretics on the nature of man. Well, I they mean, should think Augustine was, based well, upon the, his baptism, baptismal regeneration. And his views on you can lose your salvation. I mean, the comments that he makes about losing salvation. And I mean, a lot of Augustine's view, he should be just a raging heretic based upon the way Calvinists treat people today who yeah. disagree on those issues. So, so, yeah, it's a selective use of the data uh, by some Calvinists. Rather, I think yeah, what we that's, need to, that's true. It what, is some, what we need all. to say is just the Christian tradition is complex. People have different views. 
uh, but here are issues that we find general agreement on. And this is what Vincent of Lorenz, he wrote a work called The Commonitorium. So bringing it back to one of the Gallic monks, he wrote a work called The Commonitorium, which many Roman Catholics admire because it talks about how we can know what is Orthodox Christian teaching. And so Vincent talks out about how there are so many different interpretations as there are interpreters. He talks about teachings of people who are deemed heretics, but how can you know? Well, there's this threefold formula. We believe what's uh, been believed everywhere, always by all. And so this formula, the Vincentian canon, uh, is admired, especially by Roman Catholics, but Protestants, we, we've just lost touch with this, with this tradition. And so read the Commonitorium. It's, I think, 26, quote unquote, chapters. You know, I say chapters in quotes because they're like small sections. They're not like a chapter book like we have in our English books today. Uh, so it's, again, in afternoon reading, you can read the Commonitorium. Uh, so the tradition you know, is complex, but yet we find common agreement. Yeah, um, the you know the, the the hearing you talk talk through that makes me think. You know, I, I did kind of a placeholder for our thumbnails, and um, and Caleb always comes in and makes them look a, nicer when he's not able to to make the original one. And uh, this was kind of a last minute discussion for us because I had something else cancel. And so I'm thinking about telling Caleb to retitle this one uh, and call it, you know, repeating the mistakes of our past, because really, when as we've talked through this, that's that's kind of the major lesson that keeps coming up through this is is looking at how uh, historically Christians have treated other Christians in the tradition and how those mistakes have done harm to the Christian uh, development of Christian thought and, and ideas. Um, the, the boogeyman labels, the, the, you know, turning and what does this do? It's the same thing I get under comments of these things. It's like, I, you know, I, I just get so frustrated when I hear all this debating among Christians and stuff. I just won't have anything to do with it anymore. Um, and you, you hear this exasperation from, uh, you know, the, the, sometimes the typical layman who comes across these discussions and just gets so frustrated that it, it, it creates doubts. It creates, um, disillusionment about the, the Christian faith. Um, and it takes it away from that simple childlike faith they had growing up. Uh, and they get into the world of academia or debate or apologetics. And all of these new ideas are introduced to them and confusing concepts from otherwise, you know, seemingly smart and good Christian teachers and pastors who disagree with each other. And then, and then, then the, the, the kind of the fallback is, well, how can I know what's true then? Uh, how, how do, maybe it's not all, at all true. Maybe, maybe none of it's true. Um, and, and that's where you see a lot of the deconversion kind of coming from that kind of mindset. And what would you say to that, Kurt, when you see maybe uh, a brother or sister, a younger brother and sister in Christ getting introduced to these kinds of debates and arguments, and they are, they're kind of have that reaction to it of yeah. kind of this overwhelming feeling of how do I deal with this controversy? Yeah. What I would say is that uh, sometimes the scripture is clear. So I, from the, the perspicuity of scripture, it is clear with regard to matters of salvation. In other times, on secondary or tertiary doctrines, it's, it's not so clear. And so Christians have had discussions, admittedly sometimes in, in bad tones. Uh, we've had conflicts over these issues, and that's been unfortunate. Nevertheless, we shouldn't neglect the rich, deep theological tradition because there is deep meaning to be found in the scriptures, and uh, and our faith can be enriched, uh, our walk with God can grow deeper as we understand these doctrines. Uh, our our love of not just our Christian brothers, but our love of non Christians can grow as we fuller understand God's creation and what we're taught about God's creation through studying the scriptures. So it does affect uh, who we are and our walks. So for people who are dissatisfied, they sort of like, yeah, they're just turned off by these intra-Christian debates. Uh, I would just say, you know, the tone in which some of those debates isn't good, but that yeah. doesn't mean we have to ignore the Christian tradition. So, and, and to your point earlier, Leighton, maybe that means we're reading different authors than the bombastic ones. And we, we right. could read, uh, you know, Ignatius. Uh, we could read, uh, you know, St. Francis, we could read others uh, who, uh, you know, Teresa, we could read others who are, are not in these conflicts, but yet 
reflect deeply on the Christian faith and and what the scripture yeah. teaches. And that's and that's sometimes how I've replied uh, to some of the those kinds of questions or comments, whether in person people coming up to me at a conference or something, or sending me a message where I'll reply. It may be good for your soul to step away from the online debates and to be still and know that he is God, to go back to your first love, as they say, to get away from some of the controversies. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm accused, as many of you know, jokingly, we talk about the one string banjo, um, because people get the impression um, that this is all I do or talk about. And in reality, I, I may do one broadcast a week. Caleb puts out a lot of shorts and does a lot of the other things. And so usually the only time you hear me talking about this topic is when I'm online with you guys talking about it. Um, and, and you don't see uh, my personal devotions or the times I training evangelism or when I do personal evangelism, a lot of times you're not seeing those kinds of things because without that aspect of Christian discipline in my life, if I were just totally consumed with this, I, it, it would, I would be dead inside. I, I, I'm, I'm a certain of it. I, I would be, it, you know, it, I, even people have mentioned to me, Hey, why don't you do this more full time? And this is this. I, I really love evangelism and I, I, I have, you know, other focuses of life that I really enjoy that, that keeps my faith, I think, balanced and alive. That if the only thing you're doing is engaging in online discussions over controversial doctrines, it, it is really going to leave you pretty dry. And that doesn't pay the bills. We, you know, guys like us, we've got to do fundraising. You know, if if we're gonna if we're gonna be talking about yeah. this all day, we've got to sell books and speaking gigs and fundraising for the ministry stuff. So, you know, hey, which is a perfect introduction to hey, if you have not signed on to be a patron here, <laughs> just the only one, uh, please do so. We we need all the support we can get to help spread the news of God's love and provision for all people. So, <laughs> click on that link right there in the show notes, right there. Give and, me ten percent uh, of all the ones that just yeah, float okay. in. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for that for that introduction, that's good. Um, now, thank you, Kurt, for the time that you've you've taken to be here. Like I said, I will add um, that link to Veracity Hill into the show notes, uh, so people can find out more about your work. Um, is, do you have any goal to um, you know maybe a more? Uh, I, I, and I, hey, I, I take credit. Ken Wilson was on. Doctor Ken Wilson, PhD, big Oxford guy, everything else. He has his big old dissertation there, and I say. Hey, brother, why don't you break that down and, and make it on a layman level? And now he's got one of the best-selling books on uh, online covering that topic. Um, so maybe this is a option for that to happen with Dr. Kurt Jarris as well, where we say, take that dissertation, break it down for the layman, give us some meat to, to digest, and we'll have you back on to promote the new book that just released. Uh, maybe, maybe. That's yeah, that, it's on my project list. I've got a number of projects. I, really? My friend, cool. My okay. friends will tell you there's too many projects, which is a fair critique. Uh, it's on the project list. Um, and actually, um, yeah, I, I, I do have in mind to write uh, even a, a pop-level trilogy series. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm like five to ten years out from that, uh, just trying to be realistic. Um, but I did like have C the other... Kind of a C.S. Lewis kind of a thing? Uh, no, well, you know, m more of a, you know... So I'll I'll share the title. Uh, well, maybe I shouldn't. I mean, because okay, well, well hold it, hold it back. Yeah, we'll, we'll I, do I the cliffhanger. I don't want you know, anyone the, to, the, to steal We'll do the it, cliffhanger. You know? you know, they have tune in next time that we have turned on <laughs> yeah, to in learn another what, seven what, years. what it'll be. <laughs> yes, another another so ever seven years. We'll get back together, standing st standing invite. That's right. It's kind of like that thing you did with the girlfriend in high school. You know, hey, if we're not married by thirty, we'll get together. You know, that, that for right. sure. We'll just set that date. So okay, so <laughs> seven years, seven twenty years thirty, now. Leighton. I'll come on <laughs> Soter Algae One Hundred and One again. Yeah, maybe 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 before then though to talk about other things because it, it's always fun to have. It's like Samuel says here. Uh, Kurt has an infectious laugh, oh. uh, and that that is one thing about Kurt. If you get to know Kurt, he is a fun guy to be around. He makes theology fun. He makes discussing these kinds of things a, a joyous occasion, and and I appreciate that about him as a friend and a brother. And uh, and thank you once again, brother, for coming on and 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 helping us to understand these deep theological concepts. And we really appreciate it. Thank you, Layton. Go now, share Christ and show love. God bless. <laughs>